All right, I'm going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Kylie Goslin. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. This is day three of our Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference, and we're glad to have you all here. If you were able to join us this morning for the Commissioner and the CEO of Chaffin Anthony Natrajan, um, you heard a theme about housing insecurity and um, racial inequality and opportunity that followed through to the keynote speaker, Richard Rothstein, um, immediately before this presentation. So I'm eager for you all to hear what Chaffa is doing with the LIHTC program through today's presentation on the new qualified allocation plan. I think you'll um, see some, some common threads here and we'll provide a good basis for our conversation here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the partnership is a policy and advocacy organization. Uh, we focus on ending homelessness and expanding housing opportunity, ensuring that everybody can choose a home in an equitable community. Um, before we get started with our presentation today, I want to thank some sponsors that we have that have helped make this conference free for everybody. Uh, first and foremost, our leading sponsors, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. Thank you to all of you here today and to Chaffet generally for your support, as well as the Melville Charitable Trust. Their deep support has allowed the conference to happen again this year. And thanks to our collaborating sponsors, the Connecticut Department of Housing, Webster Bank, and Rockport Mortgage. We have a whole host of supporting sponsors that you see on your screen here. Thank you to all of you um, for helping to ensure that this conference continues. And finally, this particular session is sponsored by not surprisingly, Chaffa and Whittlesey. So thank you um, for your sponsorship. A few housekeeping items before we get started. The session is being recorded and we will make all recordings available to conference attendees as soon as possible. Uh, all participants have entered muted. Please remain on mute unless a speaker has asked you to unmute. If you have a technology issue, you can select the chat icon in the Zoom control panel and send a chat to PSC Zoom meetings and we'll do our best to assist you. And finally, your speakers will let you know how they would like content questions to be submitted. I know they're gonna be doing some polls and some fun interactive stuff as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our Chaffa panel to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. Okay, I think everyone can see that okay, right? Looks good, Terry. Thank you. All right, my name is Terry Nash Giovannucci. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, and I'll be sharing some high-level policy goals that are incorporated in the new 2022 and 2023 QAP. I'm joined by my colleagues from Chapa, Debbie Alter, John Cabral, and Seema Milani, who each bring their significant knowledge and expertise to the table. We're excited about this new two-year QAP and, and hope you are too. So before we get rolling, can we do a quick poll to see who is here? What sector do you all represent? Um, Well, that's terrific. So we have a good representation here of development, the development community, um, municipal and government sector management advocacy, and some other interested folks. So that's terrific. Thank you very much. So there you have it. Okay. During 2020 and 2021, Chaffa's Board of Directors and its task force met regularly, often on numerous occasions to consider the allocation of tax credits and the QAP's role in supporting this Chaffa's strategic plan and the state's housing policy goals. Um, the board and the staff were highly engaged as were our participating um, stakeholders. 
We reached out to various groups, held roundtables, listening sessions, and had some very lively discussions. And the public's feedback came to us in all matters related to the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and the allocation of federal low income housing tax credits. So the result then became some broad policy changes. Um, this was a result of tremendous outreach and engagement, uh, customer feedback and addressing comments that we had received on probably the last two, three, four years about the timing of the QAP and the, the need for developers to be informed much earlier. So first of all, it's a two year QAP and provides greater predictability to applicants. It governs both the 2022 year application round and the 23 application round. And there are two new classifications. Um, it recognizes differences between preservation and new construction deals and the um, competition doesn't occur against each other, but within classifications. So preservation is the substantial rehabilitation of existing occupied multifamily rental housing new construction is everything else. We anticipate that 25% of credits will be allocated in the preservation classification and 75% will be allocated under new construction. Of course, that could change. Um, it varies based on applications received and relevant considerations, limitations that may be necessary to achieve the objectives of the plan. Under the preservation classification, applications will not be scored. This is entirely new. They will be evaluated solely on the satisfaction of specific priorities and competing against each other. So again, there's no points award there, just the competition occurring within the category on um, these specific criteria. So there's greatest need, the connection to community revitalization, expiring use, preservation of housing tied to opportunity areas, energy efficiency and sustainability, and the experience of the developer. Um, we had heard a developer mention that, oh, then the most expensive development must be the one that's successful, but that, that's not the case at all. All of these criteria are considered within every preservation application. So there are some very specific continuing broad policy goals. These things are always in place and are very important to us. Um, rental affordability and special needs housing or supportive housing as we often are referring to it. Uh, family focus in housing, particularly meaning no age restrictions, a sustainable design and deconcentrating poverty. There remains a great need for apartments affordable to extremely low and very low income households. As you've heard early this morning from Nunthany, the statistics are appalling um, the, the weight of the burden of rental affordability on so many of our lowest income households. Um, deep income targeting, mixed income housing, including supportive housing units for the most vulnerable, remains a key policy goal as we're supporting the state's work to end homelessness. Um, new construction development proposals will continue to compete for points, and these are some of the broad policy goals under which they will compete. So in this new QAP, the weight of priority in points um, reflects the maximum, put your points where your policies are. So you'll see that rental affordability remains the highest priority and so continues to have the greatest amount of points. Um, we're back to 100 points in total. And what you'll see are changes in the distribution within each category, even though it doesn't appear that each category has changed greatly, but you will see changes that are occurring within each category to further our goals. Uh, Debbie Alter, who I will introduce next, will dive more deeply into the changes in the QAP and the point structure that will impact your applications. Thanks, Terry. Sure. Um, I did see a question come up in the chat regarding the weight of the um, criteria in the preservation classification. And I just wanted to mention that the criteria are listed in the QAP in declining order of significance. 
I don't think they were in the same order on your slide, Terry. So um, mm. if you'd like to see the QAP, it can be found on CHFA's website and the criteria listed there are listed in declining order. Okay. So uh, this year, something new that we're doing is we have a preliminary application that we're asking anyone interested in any tax credit application program to please uh, complete and submit. If you're considering a 9% tax credit uh, submission this year, the pre-application is actually due this Friday. So you would need to take a look at the CHFA website. It can be found, there's a quick click from the homepage. It's just a few pages. It's mostly yes or no questions. And you can just click right on it and it will submit directly to CHFA. Once we receive that pre-application, we will reach back out to you to schedule a pre-application conference. And attendees at this conference would be staff from CHFA underwriting, technical services, as well as DOH project management and um, architectural and technical services as well. And you are invited to include your architect, your GC, whoever has questions about criteria or um, would like to participate in that meeting is welcome to attend. No other exhibits need to be uploaded with this preliminary application. And again, they are due by this Friday because the deadline for submitting in the round is January 12th. Okay, next we have a poll. We were wondering if you would think it's beneficial for CHFA to publish the list of developments that have submitted a preliminary application prior to the uh, application deadline in January, following the, the deadline this Friday. Would it be beneficial for you to see who the competition might be? So far, it, there's nobody that said no. <laughs> it's overwhelmingly yes. That is something that we are considering doing this year. All right, thanks for that. All right, so I'm just gonna go through quickly the changes to the points criteria. And again, there this points only apply to applications in the new construction classification. The preservation classification is not scored uh, um, at all, but it is evaluated on the criteria that was mentioned earlier. So there's been no change to the points for supportive housing units. Maximum points are still received if 20% of the units are going to provide supportive services. There's been an increase to points for the number of units that serve households below 30% AMI. And to get the maximum eight points, there needs to be 25% of the qualified units have to be targeted to households at or below 30% of AMI. Additionally, a point was added for serving households above 30% AMI, but at or below 50% AMI. And this is calculated on the total number of units. So in order to get maximum points here, you need 40% of all the units in the development including the, the non-restricted, have to be targeted in this AMI range. There's been no change to points for mixed income housing. These points are still received the maximum if 20% of all of the units in the development are not restricted. We've taken out the points for preserving at-risk housing as those um, applications are in the other classification. We have added a category for an extended affordability commitment that those points can be received if the affordability is 10 years or is 10 years longer than the 40%, it's 50, uh, 50 years, sorry. Um, but those points are only provided if the development is awarded six points in the uh, development located in an area of opportunity category. So if it is in, in an uh, opportunity area and the extended affordability is gonna be 50 years or more, then those points can be awarded. 
And we have made an adjustment to the resident service coordinator category. In the past, it was one point for a part-time RSC. This year, there are two options, one point again for a part-time person. And also you can get two points if there's going to be a full-time resident service coordinator that will serve the development. Next slide, thank you. There, um, there was one, one point reduction to the cost effectiveness hard costs. Seema will be going into that in more detail in her presentation. And one point reduction to the points, maximum points for credits per qualified bedroom. Again, this is a category that all the applications are ranked against each other. The lowest credits per bedroom will receive the four points and the highest credits per bedroom would receive zero points and all the other applications will be um, awarded points on a sliding scale in between. There was a reduction in the maximum points for credit equity being less than 50% of total uses. That is goes to 65% of total uses if the development is in a qualified census tract. There was no change to the points for other permanent funding sources or building plans and specs. There have been significant changes to the sustainable design category. And again, Seema is gonna go into that in her portion of the presentation. And two points were taken away from the maximum for cost effectiveness of intermediary costs. This is another area where all the applications are ranked against each other. And the two with the lowest intermediary costs, which are third party uh, vendor type fees um, the two at the lowest will get the two points. So there really weren't a lot of changes to the uh, local commitment and impact area. Most of the points have stayed the same here. There is a new category for a concerted community revitalization plan of which three points could be obtained for that. So, um, this category is, is new and it's pretty specific as to what it requires. So I've taken the information right out of the QAP and posted it here. So basically as of the date, the preliminary application deadline, which again is this Friday, there needs to be a community re concerted community revitalization plan in place at, of which the proposed development is included in that defined geographic area. A standard land use, or comprehensive plan is not eligible unless it contains a specific revitalization component. The next criteria is uh, that the principal of the applicant cannot have been involved in initiating this plan. We will be asking the state municipality or whoever issued the plan to confirm that. Um, also, obviously, the completion of the proposed development must contribute to the goals outlined in that plan. And the last item is that uh, the state or the municipality or, or whatever group has created the plan has also made or is committed to making specific investments in non-housing infrastructure um, or amenities beyond what is proposed for the development. Okay, the next area is qualifications and experience. We had no changes there. Um, next is the opportunity characteristics. This is, this has not changed at all either. Um, the mapping piece has changed. We are using a different mapping system this time and Jonathan Cabral is going to speak about that. Thanks Debbie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Cabral. I'm a manager in the Research, Marketing, and Outreach Department at CHFA. And I'm here to talk about um, our new opportunity uh, map uh, that was just adopted uh, with this QAP. Um, so both the State uh, Department of Housing and CHFA had adopted opportunity maps um, several years ago with the intent to build more affordable housing in higher resource communities. Uh, and to also, as uh, Mr. Rothstein spoke uh, about this morning, earlier today, to really reduce segregation in the state um, in the pockets of concentrated, concentrated poverty uh, around um, like tech developments. Um, 
while the two maps had similar um, policy objectives, they did have significant differences in methodologies, uh, which did cause and has always caused a bit of confusion. Next slide. So the former CHFA opportunity map, uh, often referred to as the opportunity characteristics map, was really based on uh, municipal level data, uh, whereas the Department of Housing's map was always based on the census tract. So it, it, more, um, it more aligned with, let's say, neighborhood, um, neighborhood data than, let's say, our, our, opportun our opportunity map had. Um, the CHFA map was very binary in nature. It really compared towns to state averages, to the state average. So if a town or city performed better than, let's say, the state average when it said, let's say, when it came to the population to job ratio, it received points. If it, if it performed um, less than the state average, it didn't receive points. So it was, it was very binary in nature and was, was not as nuanced as, let's say, the Department of Housing's map. Uh, the points that went into the opportunity map that CHFA used was really focused on um, non-exempt towns uh, in the 830G list, school performance based on the great school scores, poverty level, jobs to population ratio, and also proximity to community colleges. Again, different data sets than, than had been used um, by, by the state and uh, the Department of Housing. Next slide. So both CHFA and DOH operated using two maps for several years. Again, this caused significant confusion and we had heard from developers and applicants <clears throat> that it was, um, it really was not helpful having to, to, to understand both maps. So Department of Housing commissioned a new statewide opportunity map uh, a couple years ago. And it was really a refresh of their, their current map. And it was really at that point that CHFA uh, decided that it may make sense to um, use a shared map with DOH. And with that, uh, Department of Housing did um, work with the Connecticut Fair Housing Center and Open Communities Alliance to develop a new map and really used, um, and really uh, reached out to CHFA for, for input. And so we together developed a new map, again, based mostly on the methodology from uh, DOH's existing map, but again, with better data sources and a more nuanced approach to looking at neighborhoods. Um, the map looked pretty much at three primary categories, uh, education, employment, and neighborhoods, and data associated with those based on the current literature that exists, uh, and weighted those three criteria evenly to assign um, an opportunity score at the census tract level, again, to better align with uh, neighborhoods rather than just look at whole towns and, and cities. Next slide, please. So with that being said, the, the new opportunity uh, levels were, were assigned, again, based at census track levels, uh, where a census track was assigned an opportunity score uh, based on how that individual census track uh, uh, rated uh, compared to all of Connecticut census tracts. Those census tracts were put in order, divided into quintiles, and were assigned either a very high opportunity score, a high opportunity score, a moderate score, low or very low. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just illustrate here the differences between CHFA's former uh, opportunity characteristic map and the new statewide or shared map uh, with DOH. And as you can see, uh, that the, on the top, um, on your top left corner, uh, towns were assigned points uh, based on uh, criteria that we once used, whereas the new opportunity map, to get, again, a bit more nuanced, looks at census track levels, which better align uh, with neighborhood characteristics. And so there are towns where you would find uh, higher income or rather higher opportunity census tracts and possibly moderate, even low opportunity census tracts, again, based on the resources in that community. Next slide. So with that being said, uh, each opportunity characteristic was, uh, has been assigned a points in the QAP uh, from a not as high as nine for very high and a zero for very low. Uh, but it's also, I think, really important to, to highlight that the 
points associated with the 830G list, which were once part of the former CHFA opportunity characteristic map, characteristic map uh, didn't go away. Uh, it still exists in the QAP, but as, as a separate points item, uh, six points uh, that uh, can be um, can be had on top of the new opportunity map uh, score. So those those points did not go away. And again, it is important to get uh, newer units built um, in those municipalities that have less than 10% uh, affordable uh, or deed restricted units. Next slide. So with that being said, uh, the I believe the PowerPoint presentation will be posted online and there is a link to the new opportunity map. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me if, uh, uh, if you have issues with the map, but we do have a mapping tool that you can type an address in and find what characteristic or what uh, points are associated with that, with that geography in regards to opportunity mapping. All right. So that was a quick summary of our new and shared opportunity map at DOH. I think I now turn it over to Seema, who will be talking about uh, tech services and points changes associated with those. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. So I'll go over the tech-related uh, changes to the QAP. So first off, uh, like Terry mentioned, we have two different classification, uh, two different set-asides, preservation and new construction. So preservation is essentially rehabilitation of existing occupied multifamily rental units. And uh, most likely it includes minor, moderate, uh, and you know, substantial rehabs. New construction, on the other hand, is defined as the production of new dwelling units. And, uh, you know, it would be gut rehab or new construction. Okay. So now I'll go over the points that technical services normally reviews and uh, you know what these are. So the first off is cost effectiveness, hard costs, and you can get one or two points depending on where the cost deviation is. If it is between zero to 5%, uh, projects get two points, five to 10% deviation, uh, you score one point. Then there is one point for plans and specs, at least 90% complete. And the next up, um, and there's been a lot of change in this category is the sustainable design measures. Uh, now, this one uh, has 13 points. Uh, it used to be seven points, and this has uh, gone through quite a bit of change, and I'll go over it uh, in my next slide too. So there are several categories, subcategories under sustainable design measures. Uh, first is the energy conservation. There are tiers and one could score two, three or four points. The second subcategory is green building. Again, there are tiers and you can score two or three points. Renewables, electrification and resiliency you could score one or two points. And then there is an additive point for, uh, you know, backup battery power, one point. Operations and resiliency, again, there are two tiers and one or two points. Sustainable development with digital literacy and connectivity. It is essentially broadband, it has one point. And the total possible point under uh, sustainable design measures uh, is 13. Next up is the historic place, adaptive reuse or the brownfield development. And uh, it's just the same as previous QAP. It is uh, three points. Uh, uh, next slide. Sorry, this might be a uh, Good point for a polling question. 
So what would you all say is the relevance of sustainability for your projects? So that's good. I'm happy to say uh, the majority say it's highly relevant. So that's that's really neat. Good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wonderful to hear that. Uh, uh, next slide, Terry. Okay. So as I was mentioning, uh, now we have several subcategories under the sustainable design. And we've increased the previous seven points maximum to a 13 points maximum. Uh, it's a progressive performance-based criteria such that project teams are rewarded for sustainability effort. And at the same time, they have the flexibility to choose the best building methodology for their unique project. Given the nuances, the budget, the challenges of your specific projects. Uh, the various subcategories are energy conservation, green building, renewable electrification and resiliency, operations and resiliency, and the digital literacy and connectivity. There is an inherent built-in synergy between these subcategories. And again, the approach here is a two-pronged approach. We're trying to emphasize both on the front end of the project, the planning part, application, and the award, and then the back end, which is construction, post-construction and operations. Um, and the intent is to make sure the actual built product is what we all were aspiring to build. Next one. So the first uh, big category here is uh, energy conservation. And once again, the sustainable design measures they and the points are for new construction um, set aside. Preservation, uh, you know, would be scored, it would not be scored, but there are several criteria that go into that. Uh, and I will discuss preservation once we are done with new construction. So, under new construction, energy conservation, the prerequisites are the Department of Energy's zero energy ready home certification and balanced ventilation. There are three tiers. The first tier is an average HERS index of 50 or less. And uh, you know the project should be at least 15% better than the Energy Star target index. And you get two points for that. Tier two is the, you know, it just gets more energy efficient HERS index of 46 or less, and it should be at least 25% better than the Energy Star Target Index, and you get three points for that. Tier three, energy, uh, you know, HERS index of, uh, you know, 42 or less, and it should be at least 35% better than Energy Star Target Index. Then there are two other programs that uh, would, uh, you know, get you the same points, Passive House or the International Living Futures Institute, Zero Energy Ready Homes. Uh, and there are four points for this. And just to note that all the HERS index, um, they exclude renewables. And uh, you know, for the purposes of meeting the zero energy ready prerequisite, uh, you know, if your project is receiving tax credits and is subject to, uh, you know, SHPO and NPS restrictions, uh, we would use the CHAFA standards for those particular uh, restrictions that historic uh, and SHPO may impose. Next slide. So the second subcategory under new construction is green building. Tier one is the enterprise green communities 2020 or the National Green Building Standard, GOLD. 
or leadership in energy and environmental design, lead gold. All three get you two points. Uh, tier up is tier two, NGBS Emerald, lead platinum, or the living buildings challenge go ready gets three points. If you see theme throughout is more choice, more ways for project teams uh, to get more sustainable. Next slide. So the next subcategory under new construction is renewables, electrification, and resiliency. Um, so tier one is solar PV system to offset at least 75% of the annual energy demand for site and interior common area lighting. Tier two bumps it up a little bit. It becomes 90%. And in addition to that, we are asking for all electric buildings and backup to provide resiliency to critical systems, uh, emergency lighting and access to portable water. And the case for electrification, as you all know, fossil fuel burning furnaces, water heaters, cooking range, they all have combustion byproducts that have long-term serious uh, health impacts, including asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, electrification helps us curtail greenhouse gas emissions. It helps us get to a low carbon future, a future with renewables. And, uh, you know, we'll be ready for a smooth transition to a renewable dominated grid uh, with electrification. So it is just future planning, uh, getting prepared to take the next steps when the infrastructure and technology becomes available. And uh, for resiliency, as you all know, mm, you know, We've had so many weather related events and the frequencies already um, increasing. So we want to make sure that we are prepared and we can quickly recover from this, uh, these events. Uh, then there is an addition, sorry, um, oh, sorry. sorry. No, yeah, right there. And then there is an additional point for all electric buildings that use battery storage or fuel cells as a backup uh, for providing resiliency. That's an additive point. Yeah. So the next subcategory under new construction is operations and resiliency. Tier one, uh, teams get one point for owner paid utilities. We are asking, uh, uh, for, you know, heating, cooling, and hot water at a minimum. And in addition to owner paid utilities, you have to do commissioning. So with the owner paid utilities, our goal is to ensure the residents, developer owners, and, you know, CHFA, DOH, we all reap the benefits of the investments in energy efficiency. And uh, it helps align developer owner goals with CHFA interests when building performance, maintenance, operations become paramount for all parties. It enhances the longevity of our assets and it protects our uh, residents. And with commissioning, the idea is we cannot manage what we cannot measure. So measurements and verification measures like commissioning, they ensure the performance of the built asset matches the modeled performance. So tier two is a step up a little bit, which uh, in addition to owner paid utilities commissioning, we have uh, backup power uh, to provide resiliency uh, to the critical systems. So that's two points there. And the last subcategory here is the uh, digital literacy and connectivity point. And uh, this is uh, one point for high-speed broadband access to units. And as we've all seen, uh, COVID, uh, I think, um, it doesn't need an introduction or an explanation. Uh, we've all seen how important broadband is. 
and lack of access and the cost of broadband still remains a considerable barrier for many households, specifically the households that we serve. So it's really critical that we see broadband into our developments. Yeah, next one, Terry. So that was all for new construction. Now we'll talk a little bit about the preservation uh, set aside. So light tech applications for preservations will require a scope of work, uh, scope of rehab work that includes recommendations from an energy consultant. And it needs to be, you know, the highest possible energy efficiency and sustainable design measures appropriate and practical for the development. Next one. So it includes several different uh, strategies. Benchmarking is the first one. Uh, so um, it is the EPS Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's a free tool available to everyone. Second one is energy conservation. We are expecting to see uh, average hours index of 70 or less, or a reduction of at least 30% uh, in the prehab energy use. Next one, so green building, uh, you know, choose something that is appropriate to your scope of rehabilitation. And there are programs specifically for rehab and remodeling. So you could choose from enterprise green buildings, uh, national green building standard or leadership in energy and environmental design. So EGC, NGBS, LEED, one of any of these. Next one. Uh, this uh, is a relatively low bar and it can be easily accomplished, uh, the solar PVs. So we are hoping uh, most of our rehabs would have solar. Um, again, we still ask, uh, you know, it could be on-site or off-site renewables and complete a feasibility study and an analysis of ROIs in consultation with uh, Connecticut Green Bank. The other key, uh, you know, key strategy here is resiliency. Again, we want to see backup power to provide resiliency to critical systems, energy, uh, emergency lighting, access to portable water, commissioning. We want to measure what, where we are investing all these dollars, and hopefully they're making a difference to the residents. And lastly, it's the high-speed broadband uh, access to units. Those are our key priorities for the preservation set aside as it, uh, you know, involves uh, sustainability design measures. That's all. Um, any questions for any of us? Let's see what we have. Okay, I think we answered that first question about the criteria for preservation being given equal weight. And um, while they are not, there is a, de a descending order of priority. Each one will be considered. So it's not that once you pass the first one, you don't need to worry about the rest. They're all considered. And you'll see those in the QAP, which is online, along with the opportunity map. Everything at CHFA is under, um, the LIHTC section, and you'll find lots of great information, guidelines, um, guidance on how to use things, both for CHFA and DOH. Um, someone asked, how is the information going out to the public? And we are publishing frequently asked questions. We're publishing guidelines. Um, we're putting basically everything that we create up online under that LIHTC section so that you can access it first from the homepage and then straight through to the LIHTC section to find um, links to just about everything that you're looking for. There's also on our webpage and on, on the homepage a convenient search bar. So absent um, success in finding what you're looking for, you can put key terms in the search bar and you'll find exactly what it is you're looking for. 
Um, let's see what else. Let's see what else. Okay, so the, the goal of the new QAP when it was um, finalized was primarily to address the disparities that we've seen um, as we were trying to encourage growth of low-income housing development in the suburbs and in communities that are not often served, it wasn't completely occurring. In fact, we didn't have as great a success as we had hoped. So we really went through the state's policy goals, our strategic plan, and tried to match the um, criteria in the QAP with what exactly we wanted to accomplish, which is creating sustainable, affordable housing for folks in the low and moderate income bands in areas that would provide for growth and opportunity uh, in a level that they hadn't been able to achieve before. So um, hopefully that's reflected in the points. You'll be able to see uh, you know, as you go through the points for, for example, rental affordability. That's always been a big one for Chaffa to make sure that people can afford their homes. Um, let's see. I don't see any other questions popping up in chat. I know that there was um, some interest in learning more about um, specific questions that we were submitted through the, the FAQs. And you'll see those published online. Um, Seema, John, or Debbie, is there anything in particular that you wanted to highlight or that you can think of from the FAQs that we should make sure to address? Carrie, we did get another question in the chat regarding- Oh, I missed it. pre application yeah, it just popped up. Oh, the I see. pre-application process um, asking, does it determine which projects are um, allowed to go through to a full application? And the answer to that piece is no. And to the second piece, does it provide feedback on projects? The answer is yes. The point of the pre-application conference is for um, CHFA and DOH to take a look at the proposal and discuss any areas where it doesn't meet guideline or um, potential threshold issues and for the development team to ask any questions of us regarding the, the requirements. We're not going to pre-score applications or really comment on whether something would get points or not, but we are there to answer questions about requirements. I have a question, Terry, that I think folks maybe, um, some folks have been wondering, which is, you, you talked about this a little bit, but <clears throat> what the public input processes were, there were a couple with the QAP over the last year and how those are messaged to the public, especially so folks here want to participate or have um, comments, concerns, thoughts that they want to submit, sort of where to pay attention for those opportunities as they come up over the next two years in preparation for the uh, next time this is reviewed. And to let folks know it is reviewed every two years and there is a public input process. That's a great question because we do want to hear from as many people as possible and, um, we start with typically in the fall, uh, what we call a, a public input period. We post something uh, like an announcement on the web page. We send out an e-blast. So if you're not on our mailing list, it would be a great idea to just sign up for, uh, you can go right onto chfa.org and hit, you know, the sign me up and then it'll say, what kind of news do you want? And you could just say e-blast related to multifamily. And this will get you, notification that we're something is coming up, okay, direct to your email box. Otherwise, it's on the web, and we do publish in the five largest newspapers and the legal notices when we're having a hearing, um, which we do twice a year. So it's in the fall is the input period. The spring is typically a comment period. They're, they're not very different. The comment period is generally more specific to the QAP, and the input period is the entirety of the program. So if you had any thoughts about the program, how it's run, what it should look like, anything at all, um, it, it, comments are welcome. Um, when we do the outreach, sometimes for specific items, like in this past two-year period, when we were building the sustainable design measures, 
we really looked to the experts in the field. So we, we and Seema could tell you more about this because she was leading the charge. We reached out to you know, architects and design professionals, environmental engineers, um, people who were specifically experienced and knowledgeable in sustainable design measures, energy efficiency, passive house. Um, there was a quite a large group, maybe 20, 24 people. Uh, state housing was there, CHAFA members were there, our tech services folks. And we really listened to what's possible, what's practical, what are the impediments or the, the pain points, what are the barriers to creating this sustainable design that we really need to achieve to meet the governor's goals of um, um, reduced emissions by you know, certain time periods, I think it's 2030, I'm, I can't remember, but there are very specific goals that we have to meet and this will work toward getting us there. In addition to helping the families who are living in those residences, which is also very important. Um, when we were looking at changing the classifications, we reached out to the impacted parties, folks that we thought might be most concerned would be the housing authorities because we have had in place housing authority and general class for so many years, um, but it was never our intent to abandon housing authorities, right? We really just wanted to be able to say, hey, we, we recognize that you've got preservation deals that aren't competing. You have a location that's fixed. You can't, you know, you can't be looking for points uh, on where your development is located. And we also recognize that there are many thousands of units that we'll be losing over the next, say, five, six years. Um, so preservation is very important to us. So consequently, the new classifications. And when there's something like a, a new topic that comes up, we do reach out. We had an opportunity work group. Um, trying to, again, measure what are the best things for us to do and what's practical in, in the communities and in the state. So the best bet for looking is to, you know, kind of follow our website, sign up for our e-blast list. Um, you could always send emails. We have a, an open email box, public comment at chfa.org um, to say, you know, just to, what are you doing and when can I you know, submit something or how can I participate? You, you can always reach out to me and my email, it will be um, published. I think it's at the end with all of us at the end of our presentation. So simple, it's just our name with a dot in the middle at chfa.org. So I'm terry.nash at chfa.org, debbie.alter, chfa.org, so simple. So you can you can always reach out to us individually as well. And Terry, I wanna... It's actually Deborah for me. Oh, Deborah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to note too Anybody? for folks um, that, that there are opportunities to do these public hearings. Folks can also submit written commentary, mm -hmm. emails. There's a, a variety of ways to do this. And I want folks to know that, especially folks who may be tenants or tenant advocate groups. Um, and you don't have to be an expert or really get be a developer that does this every day to comment if there are um, components of this that are of interest to you, either of, as a consumer of this product or as a you know, municipal um, employee or as someone who lives in a community, um, you can submit, you know, your comments through a variety of means, but don't be intimidated by the complexity of the QAP. Um, and please, you know, I think it's important that lots of folks participate. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's an absolutely, Action. absolutely good point because we do want to hear from the people who live in the communities and the people who are neighbors. Um, it's it's very important that we're not creating this housing in a vacuum, that everyone that we're working with, that we're serving is participating in the process. So like I said, anything goes, you can send in emails, you can send in letters, you can call, you can join in the, the forums, you know. Um, you know, express your interests, let us know what your concerns are or what your interests are, and we welcome your participation. And, you know, it helps us learn. Uh, it helps us learn what we are doing. And there are several things that may be very critical to you and we may not be aware of. And we realized a lot of it as we were going through the work group. We were, you know, communicating with residents, with, you know, uh, property managers, with, uh, 
with a variety of stakeholders, it helps to a better policy. And uh, I think it's uh, it becomes win-win only when we see participation. So please participate. Mm -hmm. Looks like there's one more question there, Carrie, that popped up in the chat before the end regarding we know for the renovation set aside, since there are no scoring, are the priorities that were presented weighted, weighted in order of importance? Okay, so I, I know it's a challenge this year that it's, it's a newly introduced concept, but the intent is, so you'll see in the QAP, the list of the criteria, and they're listed in order of importance, but each one is going to be considered. So um, so say, for example, the, the first one is the the, the need of the development, right? So someone might say that means it's the most expensive. And that doesn't mean that just because it's the most expensive, it's gonna be awarded. So we look at all the submissions and it's important to know that there's a real need. So someone that has a need might be, you know, that, that's very great, might be automatically or, or intuitively, you're gonna say that's gonna be weighted higher than one that just has some like, you know, needs a new kitchen appliance set up or something. Then you have the other criteria as you go down the list and you might say, okay, this one has a great need and it's in an area of opportunity and they have an experienced development team. Oh, by the way, they're, they're an expiring use and, you know, all those things considered make it a little bit um, more important than, I shouldn't say important, weighted probably a little bit higher than one that just has a high need. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it'll be a little bit tricky. We're going to try to explain as we go a little more, as we start to look at things um, through the FAQs, we'll be talking more about preservation and reviewing the applications. And when applicants come in um, and talk to us about th their potential projects, and maybe they have a preservation project, we'll be discussing it in that forum as well. So hopefully, it becomes more routine and more comfortable for people as we go along. This first year is, you know, a little bit challenging, I think, all around. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to our wonderful Chaffa staff uh, for walking us through the QAP. Um, this session will be available um, on the Partnerships YouTube channel. We'll link to that on our website. So if you have folks in your um, office or other folks that want to hear this and weren't able today, we'll be sharing it that way. The next session that is coming up at noon in one minute is Zoning for Equity, a demonstration of town planning and zoning for your fair share housing goal. So hopefully you'll join us for that. It dovetails nicely with all the things we've been um, talking about this morning and the QAP. So a big thanks again to Chaffa, both for sponsoring Whittlesey, for also sponsoring this session um, and for presenting here today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Afternoon. Thank Thanks you. for the partnership. Thank you. Thank you.